two hundred years ago, much of central North America was covered by vast expanses of grasses and wildflowers. The prairie. The prairie stretched from Texas to Canada and Illinois to Montana. Travelers called it a sea of grass. This view is from the Nature Conservancy's Tall Grass Prairie Reserve in northern Oklahoma. It is one of the largest patches of tall grass prairie remaining in North America. The prairie grasses and wildflowers form the base of a food web that supported a rich variety of majestic animals. In addition to birds, reptiles, and other small creatures, grazers such as elk and pronghorn antelope, and predators like grizzly bears and wolves roamed the prairie biome. The most common large animal living on the prairie was the bison. Some experts think that there were as many as 50 million bison on the Great Plains. Carl Bodmer painted this scene of bison crossing the Missouri River. The French traveler August Nice described a view of another bison herd crossing the Nebraska River. We climbed up in a hurry to the little hillock at the foot of which we were camping. It commanded a view of the plain and the Nebraska River. Here is what we saw. About 800 meters from us, amid rising clouds of dust, a herd of buffalo composed of a million animals runs tumultuously and rolls its living waves toward the river. The earth trembles under their feet. The ground also shakes under our feet. Soon, the first ranks reached the Nebraska, and they rushed into it like an avalanche. Under this furious tide, the river swells and overflows its banks. During at least three quarters of an hour, the Nebraska received this black torrent, which colors its waters with a large wake. The North American prairie was also home to many Native American peoples, including the Assiniboine, the Blackfeet, the Cheyenne, and in our region, the Wichita and the Comanche. Imagine, if you can, a vast sea of grasses and wildflowers stretching from Texas to Canada, teeming with a variety of wildlife and home to many Native Americans. The Blackland Prairie of Texas is a perfect example of a tall grass prairie, the sort of prairie that grew in the wetter, eastern area of the North American grassland biome. Early settlers of the Blackland region described vast expanses of rich, tall grasses and wildflowers. To understand the prairie biome, it is necessary to understand the roles of the plants, the grazers, the predators, and fire. The most important feature of a prairie is the plants, the grasses, and the wildflowers. The plants make up the base of the food chain. They help build the soil, and their roots hold the soil when the rain falls and the wind blows. They capture the sun's energy, and they feed the grazing animals. The grasses and wildflowers can be separated into two groups, annuals and perennials. Annual plants grow and die in one year, but perennials can live for many years. Because they only live for one year, annuals do not have deep roots. But perennials are different. Their roots can grow longer and longer year after year. The deep roots of the perennial grasses and wildflowers literally held the prairie ecosystem together. Four grass species dominated much of the Blackland Prairie. Switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue stem, and little blue stem. These grasses are famous among ranchers because they are such good food for cattle. Along with the grasses, wildflowers were also abundant. 
Again, Dr. Brooke, writing in the 19th century. It was the finest sight I ever saw. Immense meadows, two or three feet deep, of fine grass and flowers. Many of the flowers Dr. Brooks saw in the 1840s are rare today. Some prairie perennials have root systems that extend 10 or more feet below the ground. Those root systems allow the plants to survive long periods without rain. Their ability to reach water deep in the soil enabled the native grasses to grow through the dry summers and provide a great food supply for the millions of bison and other grazing animals. The perennial plants fed the bison, which in turn fed the wolves and the Native Americans. Because of the threat of wolves, the bison lived in herds. 19th century travelers frequently reported herds of thousands or tens of thousands of animals, like fish in schools and birds in flocks. Bison stayed in herds because herds made them less vulnerable to predators. But being in a herd also presented a problem. With so many animals packed into a small area, the food was rapidly eaten up. To find more food, the herds were forced to move on, to migrate. As a result, the bison did not stay in any one place for very long. They may have eaten most of the plant's leaves, but the grasses and wildflowers quickly grew back from their deep roots. Imagine how the situation would have been different if predators had not forced the bison to live in herds. If small groups of bison were spread out all over the place, then they would not have had to migrate to find new food. So they would have grazed in the same area over and over, much as cattle often do today. As we will see later, this small change in behavior makes a tremendous difference to the prairie plants and therefore to the other organisms of the prairie as well. Fire was also important to the native tall grass prairie. Without fire, trees invade and their shade kills the grasses and wildflowers. But fires and trampling by running bison killed any little trees that sprouted up on the prairie. Although fire kills little trees, the grasses and wildflowers can grow right back after a fire. This field was burned four months ago, and as you can see, the grasses and the wildflowers are already growing right back. The plants, bison, hunters, and fire each played a crucial role in sustaining the prairie biome. The plants captured the energy of the sun and provided food for the bison and other grazers. The bison fed on the plants and in turn provided food for the predators. Being hunted by those predators forced the bison to live in herds. Because herds could rapidly eat the food in one area, they moved on, giving the plants a chance to grow back. Meanwhile, occasional fires kept trees from invading and shading out the grasses and wildflowers. This was a rich ecosystem. Early settlers were attracted by the grass that was such fine food for the cattle. Over thousands of years, the activities of the prairie organisms built some of the richest soil in the world, soil that became deeper and deeper as the years passed. It was the rich soil that attracted farmers to the Great Plains. Farms on the Great Plains grow much of the world's food, but that agriculture has come at a price. Today, most of the prairie is gone, and in some areas, the soil is worn out as well. Native Americans lived on the black lands for thousands of years, but they don't appear to have done any lasting damage to the plants or the soil. They hunted and set fires, but they didn't destroy the vegetation. Real damage to the plants and the soil did not begin until new settlers began arriving during the 19th century. The first major impact of settlers was the destruction of the bison. After the Civil War, the railroads reached the plains, which made it easy to ship heavy bison hides to eastern tanneries. 
The leather was used in machinery, for book bindings, and for buggy tops. In only 20 years, hunters reduced the tens of millions of bison to only a few hundred animals. The loss of the bison would almost certainly have caused major changes in the vegetation. But within a few decades, plows had even more impact than the loss of bison ever could. The soil of the Blackland Prairie was some of the richest soil west of the Mississippi River. At first, the dense root networks of the grasses prevented plows from breaking the soil. But in the late 19th century, new plows were developed that could cut through the tough sod. Meanwhile, railroads reached the area, which allowed crops to be transported to cities in the east. The plows and railroads ushered in the cotton industry, and with it, the destruction of most of the Blackland Prairie. At first, cotton grew so well that by 1915, almost every available piece of land housed a family farm. For 70 years, the Blackland region produced more cotton than anywhere else in the world. But growing cotton year after year wore out the soil, and the vast expanses of cotton enabled pests to move from one field to the next. Then came the Depression, the drought of the 1950s, the boll weevil, and competition from cotton grown elsewhere. This combination was too much for most farmers. Many farms were abandoned. Rural populations fell rapidly, and many small towns simply disappeared. In only a few short decades, the Blackland Prairie was almost completely destroyed and its fertile soil was ruined. Despite the damage to the soil, the vegetation might have recovered, but in most places it didn't have a chance. Several factors hindered the recovery of native vegetation, especially overgrazing, lack of fire, and construction of cities, towns, and roads. The prairie plants were not hurt by the short bouts of grazing by migrating bison herds. But cattle often have a different effect. Cattle often overgraze the plants when they are confined to the same field too long or too often. Plants that get a long enough break from grazers grow fine. But plants that are grazed day after day die out and are replaced by thorny trees and other plants that cattle do not eat. Meanwhile, lack of fire allows trees to grow and pastures become thickets. Scenes like these are common all over the North Texas area. Pastures that have become so filled with trees that in many cases, little grass remains. Not only is the native prairie lost, but such places are no good for raising cattle either. Of course, Cattle are not always kept in one pasture. Many ranchers work hard to manage their animals in ways that will preserve the native vegetation. But on a trip down almost any country road, one can see pastures filled with weeds, thickets of shrubs, and cedar trees. Together, agriculture, overgrazing, fire prevention, and the growth of cities have combined to eliminate virtually all of the Blackland Prairie. In fact, experts estimate that more than 99% of the Blackland Prairie has been destroyed, making it one of the most endangered ecosystems in the United States. The destruction of the native plants has a surprising number of consequences. The most basic one is the loss of habitat for native species, not just plants, but animals and other species as well. In addition to bison, early Blackland settlers saw black bear, gray wolves, ocelots, pronghorn antelope, prairie chickens, and even jaguars. But all of these animals are gone now. Along with the disappearance of native species, 
The shift in the plants also changes what happens to rain when it falls. When raindrops hit bare ground, they break large soil particles into smaller and smaller pieces. And the small particles wash into the spaces between each other until the soil surface starts to resemble the surface of a brick. The smooth surface causes water to run off rather than sinking in. Running water washes away soil, causes floods, and turns the soil into mud that ends up in the reservoirs. The more mud that enters the reservoirs, the faster they will fill in and become useless for storing water. The increase in runoff and erosion is obvious from gully walls all over the area. These roots didn't grow out into the air, they grew in soil. Where they are now airborne, they were once underground. This gully has formed during the short lifetime of this tree. The gully only formed recently because the heavy runoff only began recently. During the last few decades, the heavy runoff began when the native tall grass prairie was destroyed. The future of the Blackland Prairie depends upon the preservation of the few remaining patches and the restoration of Blackland vegetation to other sites. A few Blackland Prairie remnants have been protected in preserves, such as the Nature Conservancy's Clymer Meadow, a 1,200-acre preserve in northwestern Hunt County, Texas. Preserves provide a place for native species to hang on and help scientists understand the prairie ecosystem. But only through prairie restoration can the black land be brought back to places where it has been destroyed. Successful restoration would not only be good for native species, but would also reestablish the natural conditions of the prairies. If the prairie were restored, cattle would have more and better food. Less water would run off, and rather than washing away, the soil would become more and more fertile. Here at the Sneed Prairie, west of Sherman, Texas, Austin College students are using controlled fires, carefully managed grazing, mowing, and seeding to restore native vegetation. Because no one yet knows the best way to restore the prairie, the Sneed Project is set up as an experiment with different techniques used on different fields. The Sneed Prairie restoration is just one of many places where biologists, students, volunteers, and other interested people are working to restore native prairies in North America. If these restoration efforts are successful, the prairies will thrive and the productivity of the land will recover. A few decades ago, the great conservation biologist, Aldo Leopold, wrote that we have yet to learn to live on a piece of land without damaging it. He predicted that no one would ever again see a thousand acres of prairie wildflowers tickling the bellies of buffalo but he also began the first major prairie restoration project. Today, lots of damaged land remains, but more and more is being learned about restoration, and more and more people are working to restore pieces of a once thriving ecosystem.